You have to make a decision one way or another because you're either going to take the Mephistophelian route and say, you know, life is so terrible that it should just come to an end and that if there is a God, he should be damned for having the presumption to make such a terrible world. Or you're going to say, no, despite everything, I'm going to work in all possible ways to make everything better and to tell the truth while moving forward. And I'm going to conduct my life according to those principles. And then I'm going to have the adventure that comes along with that and see what happens. What human beings need at the highest place is something to emulate and act out and see through. The phenomenon that has to be at the highest place has to be something to emulate and imitate. And therefore, it has to have the nature for all intents and purposes of a spirit. You have to act in the world with courageous trust, not naive trust, but courageous trust in the potential goodness of being in order to actually discover whether or not that faith is justified. And so the, and that's partly why it's faith, is that you have to put the cart before the horse. So if you're naive, you're good because you think everything is good and everyone is good. But if you're naive, you're immature and you're unwise. And then you get jolted out of that naivety by betrayal and tragedy. And then you become, or you're tempted by cynicism. And the cynicism is wiser than the, than the ignorant naivety, but it's, it's not good. It's the desert, let's say. It's the, it's, the, uh, it's the Exodus desert after the tyranny of naivety. Way out of that is to evince a courageous faith. And the courageous faith is something like, I'm going to do good despite the evidence for tragedy and malevolence and the atrocity of history and all of that. And that's part of the courage of faith. I'm going to commit myself to this. And, and that, in some sense, bypasses Pascal's wager because it, it doesn't even have anything to do, in some sense, with, what would you say, your own redemption. It's a decision about how to be in the face of the catastrophe of life. If you face what disturbs you and forces you into paralysis and avoidance and tyranny, if you face that for forthrightly and voluntarily, that that will ennoble your character and help you grow. And so a lot of what a clinician does is take a fear that someone might have that's paralyzing them and then break it down into small subsets, sort of like the brick in relationship to the cathedral, and then have people practice voluntary confrontation. And what inevitably happens is not that people get less afraid, but that they become braver and more competent. We are not masters in our own house. There are sub-personalities within us. There are complexes within us. There are angels and demons within us. That's another way of thinking about it. And they pull us this way and that, sometimes independent of our will and often contrary to our will. And so Freud's conclusion was, it's very difficult for human beings to create their own values because we have an intrinsic nature that's not subject to our arbitrary will. You can have a dialogue, an interior dialogue, that precedes something like this, and I think it's a prayer, which is, okay, I understand, because I'm reasonably mature, that there is a tragic and malevolent element to life, and it's deep enough to destabilize me and to upset my faith in existence itself. Is there a path that I could walk down that would be so rich and meaningful that I would find the challenge of dealing with the tragedy and malevolence ennobling and worthwhile. And then it's a search. You think, well, what, what, would, what would be of sufficient value to offer that possibility? And people find that in, well, they find it in love. They find it in family. They find it in friendship. They find it in sacrificial occupation, let's say. They find it in beauty. But these aren't created values. They're discovered values. I want to be free to do what I want. Okay, well, hang on a sec. Which I are you talking about there? Are you talking about the mature I that sees next week and next month and next year and 10 years out and that takes the community into account? Or are you talking about the impulsive hedonistic, self-serving, narrow eye that just wants exactly what it wants right now. And what makes you think that when you make a case for that hedonism that you're not just falling under the sway of an impulsive, short-sighted demon with the optimal set of principles 
you get the maximally desirable freedom. And it, it's not freedom from everything, and it's not freedom to do anything. It's certainly not a narrow hedonistic freedom because that backfires on you like the next day. I, I believe this, that each person is associated with the infinite in some fundamental sense. And so there's no end to the degree that a person can be discovered or co-discovered. And that's why there's variety in monogamy if it's deep. There's tremendous variety in monogamy, much more so than serial uh, sexual activity, let's say, much more. Faith is the courage to move forward in the face of the unknown. It's something like that. Or faith is the willingness to make a marital vow. Because you don't have the evidence, right? You, you love this person, and I suppose that's some evidence, but then you decide, for better or worse, despite our mutual flaws and inadequacies, we're going to bind ourselves together, and then we're going to make it work. And that's a statement of faith. It's that love is more like what you see when you see your children when they're very young, is that you see them clearly. And that's a grace, that there are some people in your life that you have the privilege of seeing in something like a totality, and then that manifests itself as love. And then that's a gift that's given to you, and then it can recede unless you take the steps necessary to, fortif to fortify it and to continually revivify it. So it's like a glimpse of paradise, that love that you fall into, but then you have to earn it. Really, if you encounter any of the tragedies of life, it's like that hedonistic short-term happiness just disappears. And if that's your orienting God, which is something like, I suppose, the poor man's Dionysius, you're just nowhere as soon as you have trouble. It's not a reliable guide. Love is a much more reliable guide, and, and that bonded faith in a marriage is a much more reliable uh, when you're in the midst of a hedonic experience. And the answer is, you get short-term and impulsive. And a lot of the pure operation of the hedonic system is short-term impulsivity. And so the pathology of hedonism technically is mania. And it's the counterpart to depression, let's say. And manic people, they want to do everything at once and they're unbelievably impulsive. And so they can't make good decisions. And you might say, well, if your philosophy is hedonic, then whatever makes you happiest is a good decision. But then you see pathologies of hedonism that produce impulsivity. And the way out of that is to recognize that it's sacrifice that's the right replacement for hedonism. Because you might say, well, I should be self-centered. We, we, we talked about this earlier. It's like, well, do you mean the self that is going to drink a quart of vodka tonight and then be hung over tomorrow? Or do you mean the self that's going to sustain itself wisely and carefully over a 40-year period, let's say, in a properly sustaining marriage. And so it isn't even hedonism. It's narrow, impulsive, immature, two-year-old hedonism. Dostoevsky said, what's wrong with this materialist utopian vision? And he says it so brilliantly with his bitter and cynical character. He says, if you set up human beings so they had nothing to do but lie around in warm pools of water and busy themselves with the propagation of the race and eat cakes nonstop. So the land of milk and honey in the narrowest possible sense, the first thing that we would do is set about the place, smashing it up just so something unpredictable could happen so that we would have our adventure. And I read that and I thought, man, that's so deadly right. It is suffering and malevolence. In, in its essence, in some an undeniable sense. And so you need a sustaining meaning to tide you over while you're suffering and while you're betrayed. And then the question is, well, where is the most reliable place to find that meaning? And one answer is, well, hedonism. And another answer might be cynicism and anarchism and, and that sort of wild life that goes along with throwing off all constraints. And there's some attraction to that. But more fundamentally, if you watch people, if you watch how people actually respond in times of crisis, they find that the responsibilities that they've undertaken in the past to form friendships, to form intimate relationships, to clean up their family and establish tight bonds, to take on some major burden and make sacrifices in their life, that's where they get all the meaning.